morning, everyone. I'm so glad that we are able to support the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I think some of you know that my life was changed at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes conference all the way back in 1962, and I'm so grateful for that uh, ministry and grateful that we can support this uh, incredible ministry. I wanted to mention to you, I don't know, how many of you have seen The Jesus Revolution, the movie? Okay, a few of you. It's a great movie, and it's being shown today up at a church that I served in uh, Old Bridge, uh, Calvary Chapel. And uh, it's going to be, doors open at 4. It's free. The film will be shown at uh, 5. If you haven't seen it, it's an incredible movie, really uplifting, powerful. It's kind of the story of how Calvary Chapel, the movement, got started back in the days when the Jesus hippies, and it's very well done. It's, uh, it's grossed uh, well over 50 million, and uh, if you know anything about Rotten Tomatoes, which I don't, but it's uh, received a 97% rating, so I guess that, that's good. So, Hey, this is a uh, the first time I've uh, been able to stand in the pulpit for a while. Um, most of you know that uh, in February I lost uh, my precious wife of 53 years, and it's been a challenging time for me. I fully, I think, understand the pain of uh, grief and loss. But I want you to know how much I have appreciated your love and support, your cards, your calls, your visits. Without you and friends that I've accumulated uh, throughout my ministry um, and my friends here, my family, uh, there's no way that I was, would have been able to get through this. And uh, it's still hard, and I still have those uh, bouts. I was doing a baseball game uh, on Saturday, and I don't know, I was just uh, all of a sudden something uh, reminded me of uh, Jean, and I just, uh, the tears started to come, and I did my best to hide the tears from both teams and the coaches. I didn't think that would be too appropriate, but uh, grief, uh, you know, somebody said you never get over uh, grief. You just learn how to manage it, and so pray that uh, I would learn how to manage it. So we're going to continue our study in a series called Breakdown as we study uh, the way that God ministers to those who struggle, to those who fall apart. And yes, Christians fall apart. We're no different than uh, non-Christians. We all have our struggles and we all have our, our bouts. We're human. Henry Wordsworth Longfellow said, some men lead and some men follow, but all have feet of clay. And that's true. Whether we're young or old or rich or poor, we all have our particular struggles. We all have our weaknesses and our frailties, and no one is exempt from trouble. Last week, Nick did a great job as we looked at Moses and we saw the challenge of Moses as he was to lead two million people, two million whiny, critical, complaining people into the promised land and the struggles that he had. And in Numbers 10, we read his uh, response. He's had it with the people and he says, you know, I'm ready to quit. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me. He was one of many Old Testament superheroes who struggled with depression and disappointment and discouragement. I think of the weeping prophet Jeremiah, the pouting prophet uh, Jonah. I think of David as he's running from Saul, hiding himself in a, a clay, a cave. I think of Moses and just his frustration of dealing with people. We all, whether we're believers or not, we go through those difficult times, those frustrating times when we just don't think we're going to be able to make it. And today, we're going to be looking at the subject of depression. And some of you may have experienced depression. 
Some of you may be experiencing it now, and some of you may be experiencing it sometime in the future. 17 million people, we're told, suffer from depression. One in every six people will experience depression during some time in their life. The cost to our economy because of absenteeism is over $2 billion. It's one of the most universal of uh, psychological disorders. It might be called the common cold of uh, psychological disorders. Now, there are days that we feel blue. There are days that we feel in, uh, discouraged. But those are usually short in duration and not deep in pain. But uh, anyone that has gone through uh, depression knows how deep the pain is. We can look at people with broken bones and we can only imagine what they're experiencing. But people who go through depression, we have no idea because the pain is not evident. But it's pain that is real. And a lot of people don't understand it. Family is inclined to say, hey, come on, you know, buck up, cheer up. You can do it. You can handle it. And they have little idea of how painful it is. It's like a dark cloud that hangs over a person's head. It makes it difficult even to get up in the morning. It makes it difficult to deal with life. Abe Lincoln said it this way. He said, the pain of Depression, if it was equally distributed to every person in the world, no one would ever be cheerful. It takes away your joy. It robs you of your spirit. You isolate. You separate from others. and You live with that black cloud hanging over your head continually. Today, we want to look at this uh, subject. We want to look at a particular character who is called the suicidal prophet. We want to look at Elijah. You know, we look at the superheroes of the faith and we think, wow, how surprising that they struggle with things like depression. But they did, and Elijah's kind of the, the poster child, if you will, for uh, depression. He suffered with it, and it's interesting that he did because we would think somebody that was able to have the relationship with God that he did, he was able to raise a young uh, widow's son from death. He was able to best the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He was able to call down uh, rain. He was able to call down fire on an offering. I mean, this guy really had a relationship with God that produced magnificent uh, experiences. And, and, you know, he just continued to do things for God that were amazing to people. Charles Spurgeon said, it's, it is interesting that a man who never died because he and Enoch were the two men that were taken up to heaven living that a man that never died was taken up to heaven by a fiery chariot and that God would cause the struggles in his life that he did. He was an amazing guy, but he, like us, struggled with life. He had won that major victory on Carmel. You remember the situation? There were the prophets of Baal, and there was uh, God, and Elijah, and his God, and there was a spiritual shootout. And Elijah built a, an altar, and the prophets of Baal built their own altar, and they were there challenging each other. Who would answer the call? And Elijah would call on his God, and Baal would, or the prophets of Baal would call on their God, and they would see who would answer, and who would answer by fire, and that fire would come down and consume the offering on the altar. 
And you remember the story, the prophets of Baal, they go ahead and build their altar, they cut up their sacrifices, and they start praying to God, and they're praying hour after hour throughout that day, calling on him, no response, no answer. They slash themselves, they cut themselves, they're doing everything that they can to get God's attention, and Elijah is mocking them, and Elijah says, hey, come on, maybe you need to speak louder, maybe God is sleeping, maybe he doesn't hear you. And we know God doesn't answer those prophets of Baal, but immediately when Elisha leaves uh, his sacrifice, builds his uh, his sacrifice on the altar, and he calls on God, and immediately God responds and consumes that offering on the altar. And the people are just amazed, and they start cheering, the Lord is God, the Lord is God, and it is an exciting time. You can only imagine how Elijah felt and what he was experiencing. And he calls the people to seize the prophets of uh, Baal, and they're taken down to the Kishon River, and they're, they're slaughtered. And we would think, wow, what an incredible experience. This was, you talk about mountaintop experiences. This was the top of the mountain, but we know the rest of the story because Elijah had to come down from that mountain. And oftentimes, as we experience those high points, those high experiences in our life, we discover that they don't last. And oftentimes, disappointment and discouragement and, yes, even depression follow those high points in our life. Here was a major victory, and we would expect that Elijah would be elated, but we see him a day later running for his life, heading south to Beersheba, 20 miles away, there to get away from Uh, Jezebel, who has put a contract out on his life, sitting under a broom tree, wallowing in self-pity. How strange. Victory one moment, defeat the next. uh, Just uh, encouraged one moment, discouraged the next. Elated one moment, deflated the next moment. And I think probably all of us can identify with that. We've all had those kind of mountaintop experiences, and then we've had to come down. I know that for me, Easter is one of those times, you know, Easter service, you know, people are uh, filling the church, and there's great music, and you just, as a pastor, it's an exciting time, but then there's always the following week when the church is back to half empty, and discouragement and depression can set in. So, we know that discouragement and depression can often come after we've come down from the mountaintop experience. And so as we look at 1 Kings 19, I want to read uh, part of this chapter to you to kind of set the scene for the things that I want to share this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to chapter 19 in 1 Kings. We read, now Ahab, who was Jezebel's husband, told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of those prophets. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, and he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush, and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up, Elijah, and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And Elijah ate and drank 
And then he lay down again to sleep. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. And now the Lord appears to Elijah, and the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he replied, I've been very jealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, have torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I, the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, a small, still voice. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Or Elisha. Elijah. <laughs> And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one that's left. And they're now trying to kill me also. Elijah is there in the cave, having his own little pity party. Woe is me, I'm the only one. Everybody has turned away from God. And God reminds him that he isn't alone, that there are 7,000 others, prophets like him, who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And then in that chapter, he goes on to give uh, Elijah a responsibility. He gives, them a, he gives them a call, and he says, I want you to go, and I want you to anoint your servant, Elisha. And I want you to go ahead and anoint King Jehu. And I want you to go ahead and minister and mentor to your friend, Elijah. Elisha. And so we're told Elisha went on to minister and joined with Elijah, and they developed a ministry together, and they served together. And that's what God often does, isn't it? He will put people into our lives at the time that our life is in the depths. When we need somebody the most, he'll bring along a friend, a friend that will come and encourage us. Encouragement is so, so very important. You see, Elijah had lost his perspective. It was as if he was looking through dark colored glasses. His view of life was distorted. He couldn't recognize that God was with him on the mountaintop, but that God would continue to be with him in the valleys. And there in that valley, there in that cave, he felt alone, he felt afraid, and he felt exhausted. He felt burned out, he was, felt hopeless, he was singing the blues, and so many times in our lives there have been times like that, after something significant has happened, and God has showed up in a big way, there's always that time that follows, that time that leads oftentimes to discouragement. 
and depression. But Elijah survived that depression. He climbed out of his misery. And this morning, I want to suggest a couple of ways he did it. And hopefully, these are ways that will help us when we go through our times of depression or even discouragement. The first thing that we notice that happened was that God got Elijah in a place of rest. You see, Elijah had found a place under that broom tree, and he was exhausted. He had gone ahead and taken an 18-mile trip to Beersheba. He had no food. He had no drink. It, uh, he had already dealt with uh, the events on Mount Carmel. Exhausted, he sat there under that broom tree. And so many times when we are exhausted, we become uh, prone to depression. He needed time away. He needed time to rest. And so do we. Sometimes we are so busy doing good things that we wind up exhausting ourselves and we wind up as those who experience depression. We need to be renewed. We need to be recharged. We need to take time off. We need to take vacations. But so often we are in a holy hurry. We always have got more things to do and more events to attend. I remember the story of the uh, little boy who saw his dad who had come home from work, and he opened his briefcase, and he had all kinds of work to do, and he said to his dad, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, I had a lot of work at the office, and I had to bring it home because I just don't have enough time to do it. And the little boy looked at him and said, well, why don't you... Uh, go into work tomorrow and tell your boss that they need to put you in the slower group. And there are some times that you and I feel like that. We really need to be or we would like to be in that slower group. We can't go through life full throttle. We need to idle down. There needs to be time away. There needs to be time for rest and relaxation. Somebody said, I'd rather rust out than burn out. And whether you rust out or whether you burn out, you're both of these. uh, The results are the same. You're out. So rather than burning out or rusting out, I believe God calls us to live out, to live out our faith in Jesus and trusting in him to provide for us. We look... uh, At Mark uh, chapter 6, Jesus had been ministering with his disciples to a great crowd. And the people were pressing in upon them, and they had ministered to them all day. And they hadn't had any food. They hadn't had a time to rest. And Jesus recognizes that. And Jesus says, we need to come away. We need to go to a lonely place. We need to get some rest. Jesus recognized the need to separate. And so he says to his disciples, you need, you you need a break today. Come, let's go. And they get away and they spend time together getting renewed and refreshed. And if Jesus needed time to get away and be refreshed, so do we. God knows that rest is so important, that we have a balance in our life. He knows that if we don't come apart, we will come apart. And so, among the Ten Commandments, which deal with things like murder and stealing and adultery, he includes rest because he knows how important rest is for us. And so, he says there are seven days, and one of those days is a day that you should set aside for rest and relaxation and renewal. 
Charles Spurgeon's son, Thomas, who was forced into inactivity because of health issues, said something that I can identify with. He said, I fear that I shall find it hard work to do nothing. And how true that is, how true it is that sometimes just doing nothing, because we're so unused to it, is hard work. Many a workaholic live like that, guilty of not being able to accomplish everything, and they're always on the move. And when they're not, they feel guilty. We need to learn how to live a balanced life between rest and leisure and work and service. And unless we do, we will become, as someone said, either a basket case or worse yet, a casket case. I remember back in the 70s when I was in Philadelphia, and uh, I was in a church, and there were a lot of exciting things happening in the church. The church was growing. We had a lot of programs, and I was going from one place to the other and meeting with people and uh, trying to be what I thought was super pastor. And after about uh, a year of this and neglecting my wife and not really being sensitive to her needs, we had three children at the time, and two of them were uh, very, very, very young. One day she simply packed up her children and headed north to spend time with her mom. I hadn't experienced, I hadn't realized just what she was going through. I was so involved in frenetic activity and doing all of the good things and trying to build the church. And during that time I was continually exhausted. I was going from one meeting to another and All the while, she was feeling alone and lonely and neglected. And I got together with a pastor friend of mine. She'd been away a couple of weeks, and I was trying to explain to him all of the great things that were happening in the church, and my wife really didn't understand and didn't really appreciate what was going on. And I'll never forget his words, words that changed my life. He said, if you lose your family, you lose your ministry. And that was one of the greatest lessons that uh, I ever learned. I needed to slow down. I needed to reprioritize my life. I couldn't be busy always doing and doing. I had other commitments, and I needed to find a balance between ministry and my family. And perhaps there are some of you who need to find that balance as well. And I encourage you to do as I've done, just ask the Lord to show you how you can find that balance. And I'm so grateful that I learned that lesson and that God gave me 53 years of a wonderful life with a precious woman. But sometimes we need to learn. Sometimes we need to slow down. But we, not, we need also to do something besides rest, We need to learn how to to talk. We need to be able to talk with others. We need to get our feelings out. We need to be around people who will listen to us. Elijah was alone. He didn't really have anybody to talk to, but God talked to him. God said, hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah engaged him in conversation. And you know, in Scripture, we often find that God asks questions of people when he really knows the answer. Adam, where art thou? He knew where Adam was. Moses, what's that in your hand? That staff. God knew it was a staff, but he still asked anyways. Abel, where's your, your brother? Or Cain, where's your brother? And God knew where his brother was. He was dead. Sometimes we ask questions in order to gather information. But you know, the most valuable thing about asking questions is it puts the focus on other people and not upon ourselves. It gives other people the opportunity to talk. And if we're dealing with someone who is struggling with depression, we need to be good listeners. 
And if we are struggling with depression, we need people around that will listen to us, who will be non-judgmental, who will love us. People who, in spite of what we share, will still accept us and honor us. Communication is so important during the time that I um, was dealing with Jean's illness. In the last couple of weeks, I was so blessed by the people around me who were just there, just there to listen to me. Now, we didn't talk very much, but I knew that they were there, and they were the kind of friends that I could say anything to, and I know that they would still love me. Those of us who struggle with depression need that kind of person. I get together once a week and have been doing so for many, many years with a couple of friends on Wednesday morning, and it's just a time for us to have some mutual accountability and to talk with one another. And They're close, and so I can share just about everything that happens in my life, and I don't know where I would have been during this time of my grieving if I hadn't had Dan Herman or if I hadn't had uh, Teddy O'Neill or Harriet or a host of other people who were just there for me, just to listen to the hurt. The head of the University of Oregon Medical School said, more good is done between friends at 10 o'clock in the morning over a cup of coffee than in a doctor's office all day long. You see, when you talk with a friend, that friend can help put things in perspective for you, can help you see and sort out your problems, can help you address your problems. But so many times, people that go through depression want to isolate themselves. They want to separate themselves from others, and so they don't have anybody that they can communicate with. Oh, lucky are you if you have those kind of friends with whom you can talk with. A word of caution, however. We probably all know those people who are always wanting to talk with others about their problem. And you see them coming and you want to run the other way because you've heard the same old record again and again and again. People that do that will soon not have any friends left to talk with. So be careful. Make sure you identify those kind of friends that you can trust, but don't take advantage of those friends. But you can talk also with God and how important that is because, you know, you can say anything to God. He's not uh, unable to hear your pain. He's not unable to deal with your anger. He is non-judgmental. He will understand your pain. And in spite of what you say and in spite of how you feel, He'll love you, and he'll accept you. And that's what friends do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how distorted your thinking is. Your friend will love you anyway. So when we're dealing with depression, it's important to realize a need for balance, for rest, to get away. It's important to be able to talk through what you're experiencing Thirdly, it's important to recognize we need to get involved with others. We need to serve. You see, God could have left Elijah licking his wounds in that cave, but he didn't. He gave him some time alone, but then he realized that there was time that Elijah needed to get involved. He needed to get busy. He needed to serve others. There's a time when 
self-pity is over, when isolation is detrimental. And sometimes we need to get away. But if we isolate ourselves from the very people who can help us, we'll seldom get over the experience of our depression. And God knew that Elijah needed to take his eyes off himself and focus upon other people. That's the quickest way to heal, to change your focus from yourself to your focus on others. And when you serve and help others, you often find that you serve and help yourself. I have shared with you, perhaps, Carol Menninger's comments when somebody asked him. Carol Menninger was one of the great uh, psychiatrists. And someone asked him at a conference, what would you do if you felt depression coming upon you? And they all in the crowd expected him to talk about the importance of psychiatry and you needed to see a psychiatrist. But that's not what he said. He said, you need to go straight to the door, your own door. You need to turn the knob. And you know you need to go across the railroad tracks and you need to find somebody that needs your help and you need to minister to them. That was really the beginning of a 12-step program for dealing with depression. Step number one, find somebody who has a need and help them. And then steps two through 12, repeat step number one. You see, we can often help deal with our own pain by dealing with the pain of others. God has given us comfort. The Bible says he comforts us. Why? In order that we might comfort others with the comfort that he has provided us. So in reaching out to others and in comforting them, we find that we ourselves are comforted. Yes, rest, talking things through, Serving and then finally being good listeners as we sit at the feet of God. Elijah wanted an answer. He wanted to know what he needed to do. Oftentimes, uh, when we are in that kind of situation, we're looking for God to lead us in some miraculous way, some big event, something significant that makes it very, very clear what we're supposed to do. We pray for guidance, we pray for direction, we pray for a sign, and we're looking for some significant sign. But you know, God doesn't always speak in wonders, but he does speak in whispers, and that's what happened in this case. God sent a whirlwind. He sent a, a uh, he sent a storm. He sent wind. He sent an earthquake. He sent fire to try to get uh, the attention of Elijah. But you see, God's answer was not found in the wonders of the fire and the earthquake and the wind but it was found in a still, small voice. And we only can hear that still, small voice as we set time to get apart and allow God to speak to us. And sometimes we're looking again for those significant things, but he wants to speak to us patiently and tenderly in a still, small voice that is very, very difficult to hear and to sense. The Hebrew expression for a still, small voice I found interesting. It literally means a voice low, a gentle silence, a low whisper. God speaks in low whispers. He speaks in gentle silence. And unless we are quiet and open to his Holy Spirit, we'll not hear the message that he has for us. Elijah needed to hear that there were still 7,000 who had 
not bowed their knee to Baal. He needed a new perspective. He needed to realize that there were others out there that were faithful. God gave Elijah a friend. And so many times, a friend is so important in dealing with our depression. He gave him a friend who he could minister with, a friend that would care for him. And so begins the relationship, the mentoring relationship between Elijah and Elisha. He found a friend, and we need to find those kind of friends who will love us and accept us and care for us. And they're right here, right here in the church. You heard me say many times, every member is a minister. Every single one of you has something to do. Every single person in front of you or in back or to the right or to the left, they're here with a need. And if they're honest and open enough, they'll acknowledge their need. Maybe you're the one today that's called to meet and minister to that need. And yet so oftentimes uh, we come to church and we hear the final song and we're out the door. We really don't take time to listen for the hurts in the hearts of others. There's a broken heart today in every one of these chairs. We all have our areas of need. We all have our pain. And you may be just the one today to minister to that person who comes with that pain. We have over 150 people involved in small groups. That's amazing for a church this size. I don't know how many groups we have. But if you're not involved in a group, if you're not involved with some other group of people that you can be honest and open with, let me be frank with you, you are an accident waiting to happen. We need each other. David, when he was depressed, cried out in Psalm 42, verse 5, Oh God, why am I so depressed? Why, I, why am I in such turmoil? And then he says, I will hope in God and I will praise Him forever. That's the secret. Even when you don't see him, even when you don't hear him, even when you don't feel his presence, you need to praise him and honor him and worship him and adore him and recognize that even if you don't hear him and you don't feel his presence, that he loves you and he's there for you. Paul said something of the same thing from not the Statler Hilton, but a musty prison cell in Philippi when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. How could he rejoice? How could David rejoice in the midst of his trials? Because he recognized that God loved him and that God sent His Son, Jesus, into the world to die upon a cross in order that we might have life and have it not only now, here, abundantly, but eternally. God still speaks. God still is available. God still loves us. There is no problem that is so big for God's power or too small for His concern. So no matter, no matter how big your concern is or how small it may be, God cares about you. He said, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And as we think of those verses and as I close, I encourage you to be reminded that 
depression, although one of Satan's sharpest weapons. There is nothing that is sharper than God's Word, which reminds us that if God be for us, who can be against us? And that greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. May our relationship with God be one of one that is personal. May we trust in him for his guidance even when he seems distant. May we serve him as we serve others. May we find balance in our life as we find opportunities to rest. May we find those opportunities to go and serve others knowing that as we do, we ourselves will be served. For it is more blessed to give than to receive. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and uh, to play. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. We're going to get ready to enjoy a family meal together as we celebrate communion. And my encouragement to you is when you receive the elements, that you take time to reflect upon what God's still voice might be saying to you as you wish to serve. Ask Him to show you. Ask Him to reveal to you what you need to do and what you need to be in order to honor and serve Him. So, on the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took bread, Paul tells us, and after he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took a cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance that Christ died for your sins. And as often as you eat the bread and as often as you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So take this bread and take this cup. Hold it in your hands and ask God to reveal to you what his desire is for your life and what changes you need to make to be his better servant. Let us pray.